Well, welcome to St. Peter's Online. We're so glad that you're with us today. My name is Xavier, and whether you know Jesus or not, or whether you're just here investigating things or interested, warm welcome to you. In a moment, you will hear the Bible read and then explain. We firmly believe here at St. Peter's that God speaks to us today through His life-giving Word. And my prayer is this will help you to know Him or to know Him better. Enjoy following along. We're going to have a word from the Scriptures this morning. It comes from the New Testament, from the Epistle to the Galatians by Paul. And we're reading in chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 16. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with one another, so that, so that you do not know what... They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live by the, like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the sinful nature with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. May the Lord bless that to us. The second reading is from the book of James. James chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. book of James, towards the back of the Bible... Chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full, full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Morning, everyone. Good to see you this morning. If I haven't met you, my name is Xavier, and I'm the senior minister here, and I'll be bringing uh, the message this morning. Let me just see if the slides are working for me. They are. Um, when I, my wife and I were over in France, um, I had a close friend called Mike, Mike came to know the Lord Jesus and he came to know how just how deeply, deeply loved he was by God. And this transformed his life. Yet Mike lived with same-sex sexual attraction. He lived with same-sex sexual attraction. But because uh, of Jesus and the massive transformation that took place in his life, he was willing to leave behind his homosexual lifestyle and he chose celibate singleness out of his love for God, knowing how much God loved him. And we met up over seven years, quite regularly, every week or every second week, we'd grab a drink together, uh, we'd chat about life, we'd share our joys and struggles, we'd read the Bible on occasion uh, and pray for each other, and we'd hold ourselves accountable in all sorts of different areas of life. 
And Mike wanted me to ask him from time to time, not all the time, but just ask him how he was going in regards to sexual temptation. And I said, well, Mike, why don't you ask me as well? Because <laughs> I'm a sexual being. I get tempted in different ways. And so that's what we did. And I really enjoyed my friendship with Mike over those seven years. And we would talk about our sexual, you know, being sexual beings and temptation. But it was only just, it was just a part of a friendship that I really enjoyed. Um, here at St Peter's, we normally chip our way through different books of the Bible, chapter after chapter, verse by verse. And I think this makes a lot of sense uh, because in this way, God sets the agenda for us. Uh, he sets the agenda. He brings up the questions that he thinks are important for us as human beings to know him and to flourish under him in the world. Uh, life is so complex. <laughs> Who am I to choose what's important for us? I, kind of, I, I think it kind of makes sense that we do it that way. However, from time to time in church life, we take a break from our normal pattern and we consider certain topics. And um, topics that are raised by our culture that are worth thinking about and talking about. And so today and next week, we're going to be thinking about same-sex attraction. Same-sex attraction, just a very specific topic, but hopefully it's going to be helpful for us. And in the following two weeks, we're going to think about the whole gender kind of question or the, what some people might call the transgender revolution. Now, I don't know if you're a follower of Jesus yet, uh, if you're new and amongst us for the very first time, welcome. It's fantastic to have you amongst us. Um, I hope you're investigating Jesus. We believe that he brings life to the full and flourishing life. You're going to hear a little bit today about how we think about these things. You're going to hear a little bit about our worldview. You might find it attractive. You might find it interesting. You might actually find it challenging. You may even be angry with me afterwards. If you are, that's okay. <laughs> Come and chat to me, uh, and I'd love for you to challenge me. You know, here at St. Peter's, we know many of our... We have many of brothers and sisters in Christ in the world, uh, perhaps also amongst us, who love the Lord Jesus... They live by his word, his life-giving word. People like Vaughan Roberts and Sam Albury and Rosaria Butterfield and like my friend Mike, who clearly trust God, yet they experience same-sex sexual attraction. That's a reality in their lives, even though they may not act out on it. Now, how are we to think about this as a church family? Um, how do we speak about it in a way that's honouring to God? How do we help each other in all this in regards to our sexuality and desires and feelings that we might have? Well, the subject is complex. I've been reading as much as I can with all the time the Lord's given me, listening to as many people as I can on this subject. Since the subject is so complex, we could come at it at lots of different angles, different ways. We could talk about our sexuality in general, um, what a marvellous gift it is from God. Uh, we could affirm the goodness of sex in marriage between the bond of a man and a woman. We could indicate how our brothers and sisters in Christ who experience same-sex sexual attraction, uh, they uphold the biblical vision. They actually say this is the way we are to flourish. They think it's to be wholesome and good. Uh, how do we do this in the next 25 minutes or so? Well... I want to come at it from the angle of desire and temptation. Now, I know um, Grant said we're also going to be thinking about love, but it's mainly desire and temptation. <laughs> Maybe next week we'll think about love. But If you are a believer of Jesus, um, you will have desires and attractions. We all do. <laughs> Yet you will know that Jesus gently teaches us and tells us that our desires are disordered, broken, and corrupted. Uh, this is the case for every single human being, says Jesus. We have desires and some of them are disordered and corrupted. And one of the big messages I want us to go away with today is that we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat, every single human being. Um, yet, the believer in Jesus has mixed into that, this whole world of desire, a new desire, a new powerful desire, a new powerful desire that brings freedom that comes through the work of the Holy Spirit that changes things. 
And we're going to think about that in a moment. So we're going to consider attraction and desire, what the Bible has to say about that. Uh, we're going to think about temptation that all believers face. And then we're going to ask the, the question, is same-sex sexual attraction a sin? Uh, where do we situate it? And then next week, Andy's going to help us to get a little bit more practicable, practical in regards to how we care for each other and all these things. So you're up for that this morning? All right. So desire and attraction. And I'm not simply going to talk about sexual desire and attraction. I want to go very broad um, and think about desire and attraction in a wide sense. And the Bible teaches us that we all have desires, we know that. Some of them are good, yet all of them can be corrupted. Here are some of the good desires that come from God's Word. Uh, in the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, you know, in the Garden of Eden there, uh, the trees are described as being desirable to look at and also desirable for food. God made it that way, that we are to desire these good things that He created. We also see in the, in, in, in the, in the Old Testament that God's Word is to be desired more than gold. <laughs> it's just so valuable to hear from our Creator. We should desire that. Um, Jerusalem, for instance, is the place where God desired to place His name before Jesus came. God desires certain things. When you go to the New Testament, the part of the Bible after uh, Jesus came and died and rose, um, we see that Jesus desired to do God's will. Uh, we see Paul, the great Apostle Paul, for instance, desiring to see other Christian brothers, to be encouraged by them to be, and to encourage them. He, we could see him desiring to be with the Lord. Uh, it's clear that desires can be good. Yet the Bible also talks about the desire of the flesh or the desire of the sinful human nature. That's another way you could translate it. So I'm, I'm going to just go to Galatians chapter 5, and it's up here on the screen for you. We're going to flick around a little bit today. I'll read it out. This is Paul speaking to Christians, saying, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. Some of your Bibles may have it in the plural here. In the Greek, it's the desire of the flesh. It's singular. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh, and these are opposed to each other. So the believer, the person who's trusting Jesus, who has been saved and who knows Jesus, who has the Holy Spirit, now experiences in their desires a conflict. Sparks there. There is a desire of the flesh which is against the desire of the Spirit. Now, the desire of the flesh here is not simply talking about sexual desire. No, it's way bigger than that. Now, the desire of the flesh is to really be in the place of God. And before someone has their life transformed by Jesus, radically transformed, there, is, there was one dominant desire, the desire of of the flesh. It's the desire of the fallen human nature. And as a result of that, there, were, there was one kind of inclination, um, a little bit like lawn bowls. Anybody played lawn bowls here? Some of you had? Yep. I've played once. That was enough for me. <laughs> Takes forever for the ball to get... No, anyway. Um, the big black balls, apparently now they're coloured, but I think in the past they used to be not the jack, the little round, the big black, the big balls, right? <laughs> um, if you know anything about the game, they all have a bias. They all have an inclination, a tendency in them. Um, they will always, you roll them down, they will always turn one way. Nothing, you can, it's just the way it is. And God tells us through the Bible that our fallen human natures are like that. We have an inclination, a tendency within us. We lean towards trusting ourselves rather than trusting God. Uh, we tend to do our own thing rather than wanting to follow God's ways. We can't help but put ourselves into the driver's seat and we stick God in the back in the boot as a, a jack that we get up from time to time or we just completely ignore him altogether. That is our sinful human nature. Our desire is towards self-rule, self-determination. And what this does is it skews all our desires. Even the good ones can become corrupted. What has this to do with same-sex sexual 
attraction. Well, let's go to Jesus on this, okay? So let's listen to him. I'll put it up here on the screen. Jesus says, what comes out of a person is what defiles him or her. For from within, out of people's hearts, come evil thoughts. And I think evil thoughts is like the big banner here, or, you know, sinful desires. That's the big banner. And then he goes on and lists out the whole kind of different things they can be. So he goes on to say sexual immoralities, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, evil actions, deceit, self... Uh, self-indulgence, envy, slander, pride and foolishness. He says, all these evil things come from within and defile a person. Now, it's not a pretty list, is it? And so Jesus is saying, in our hearts, we have these thoughts, we have these desires residing there. This is part of that kind of bias, this tendency of our fallen human nature. And this is the boat, Jesus says, we are all in. In the heart of every single person, these things are here. Now, where would we situate same-sex sexual attraction? Well, Jesus would put it under, here's a diagram for you, he would put it under the banner of sexual immoralities. Now, that's a very broad term uh, for any desire or any practice for sexual in- intimacy outside of what God designed it to be, uh, f- to be used for, for our flourishing. Uh, where it was designed for, between, uh, for the bond between a marriage, uh, in the marriage of a man and a woman. So it's just a subset of a range of things. So let's notice the broad range of desires here and thoughts that are present in our hearts. Let's take self-indulgence as one, okay? I can have the desire to eat bacon. Nothing wrong with that, is there? Unless you're a vegetarian or vegan or something like that. I had bacon yesterday morning. Beautiful. (laughs) But I can indulge that desire in an excessive way. In fact, my wife helps me not to strap it on. (laughs) It can be destructive, right? Let's take another one. Murders (laughs) or murder. It's not just the act. Jesus actually taught us we can have the desire in our heart. Even the desire can be sinful. We can be angry in such a way that we want to get rid of somebody. Well, let's take um, sexual desire. A husband desires to be sexually intimate with his wife. Well, that's a great thing, good thing, a normal God-given appetite. But that desire can be tainted, by example, by fantasies of another woman that he's seen on pornography recently. Good desire, corrupted. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, (laughs) but you can see how this whole complex world of our desires within, how how tangled up it can get. And so same-sex attraction is just a small subset of a whole stack of other things. And when when I look at my own heart, you look at your own heart, even the very best things you do can be tainted and corrupted. You go, oh my goodness. What is going on in here? The marvellous news for us as Christians is that when we come to the Lord who knows what's going on in our hearts and we ask for forgiveness and we lay our lives down before him and we say, I want you to be king now, do you know what he does? He cleanses the whole lot. (laughs) We're no longer defiled in his sight. He frees us. He forgives us. And he accepts us. And he works with that disordered and broken nature that we have so that we might flourish to honour him and flourish for others. Isn't that marvellous? We are so thankful to the Lord for doing that for our hearts. So what about same-sex attraction then? Well, the desire for intimate, close, accepting friendships is a marvellous, good and healthy thing. I really enjoyed my friendship with my friend Mike over in France. Um, Loved him, and he loved me in return. I miss seeing him, actually. He's now living in Canada. And we ought to encourage healthy same-sex relationships. Yet when the desire for friendships like that is mixed with a desire for sexual intimacy in a way that God never designed it or intended it to be, it's become corrupted and disordered 
And that's what Jesus is saying. So what I'm trying to say is that we're all in the same boat at the end of the day. We've all got desires that are tangled up and disordered. Um, and all of us, actually, in the sexual realm. None of us are free from this. None of us can claim to be better. We're all messed up in that sense. And sure, we might be, each one of us, struggling with different things, but we all uh, are the same. Now, I've been listening to many Christians who experience same-sex sexual attraction. Uh, they have desires that they don't want, actually, um, they have the Holy Spirit in them now. They want to live for Jesus. They want to honour their Lord. And they look forward to the day when the struggle will be gone. And many of them question, why did I end up with this, um, this particular struggle? Uh, is it nature? Am I born this way? Um, are there biological explanations to this? Or, or is it nurture? Is it my experience of life, my upbringing or society or maybe trauma or abuse or even sexual abuse, sometimes that comes into play. I can just say that the issues here from my reading in regards to nature and nurture are complex, very complex. And I don't think there are simple answers. We're complex beings. If you want a helpful discussion on this, uh, can I recommend this book, The Gender Revolution by Patricia Wirakun? Um, there's a whole chapter there in regards to desire and the biological factors that could be involved in it. Um, as far as, and I've put it, by the way, on your sermon outlines and some more other helpful uh, resources at the bottom, if you want to think further. As far as I can tell from the reading that I've been doing so far, there is no scientific evidence of a biological determiner. There is no gay or lesbian gene there are some indicators that testosterone levels in the womb may play a part, but they don't determine orientation because nurture is very important and so is choice. At the end of the day, uh, we can choose to act out on our feelings or not. And certainly if we have the Holy Spirit, that wonderful new desire within us, that helps us to follow God's ways and to flourish. Now, before I get on to my second point, <clears throat> I just want to say a word to parents here, and then I want to say a couple of words to those here amongst us who might live with same-sex sexual attraction. I know that there may be parents amongst us who love the Lord Jesus and whose children may have chosen a homosexual lifestyle. And this can be enormously challenging and, can I, dare I say, painful reality. I think it's important for us as parents to remember that God, who is a perfect Heavenly Father, has children, so to speak, who will sometimes turn against His good ways for our flourishing. And so you can have loving, caring, supportive parents whose children will make their own choices in life. In fact, you can have loving, caring, supportive parents whose children may experience same-sex sexual, sexual attraction, but whose children actually believe in Jesus and want to live for him. It's just part of the world we live in. What if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus and you have these feelings? Uh, well, it's great to share that with somebody else and to confide and that they might pray, pray with you and support and the other person can share also their struggles. I mean, we're all in the same boat. You might be asking, why do I have this and not others? Um, can I recommend this website, uh, Living Out? It's good for all of us, actually, um, where you can hear many other Christians who have struggled with this. Um, what I have learned listening to them is that a better question is, it's not, why do I have it? course you may not find the answer to that but what do I do with it um, how do I live with this and that's what we're going to turn to now we're going to turn to the whole subject of temptations the Lord tells us uh, since we all have desires that are disordered um, that with the help of the Holy Spirit we are to resist 
That's what we're to do. We are to resist those desires that lead to sin, that then will lead to death. We are to resist, not simply for that, but because God loves us and His ways are good and they will lead to flourishing. So we are to resist. So let's listen to James on trials and temptations and we're going to go broad again, okay? (laughs) So here's um, from the book of James. James says, Blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So here we see that in life we can get tested by various things, and we all go through trials of some shape or another. Some can be big, some can be smaller, some can be long duration, some short duration. We can't avoid it. It's almost like the whole of life is one big, huge test. And James says, you endure that trial, you keep trusting in God, following Him, turning back to Him. God will give you, at the end, the crown of life. That's marvellous incentive to keep at it, to stand firm. But here's the thing. With the test or the trial can come temptations. The temptation to reject God's way or to go your own way. And so the external test can be met with internal temptation. Um, What do they say? Uh, If you squeeze an orange, what do you get? You get orange juice, right? If you squeeze a sinful human being through a trial, what do you get? Sin. There you go. (laughs) That's what trials do. Um, uh, When we're under trial, under pressure, that can happen. Uh, Any parent with little kids, all day long looking after the kids... That's a test, don't you reckon? <laughs> it's going to be, you're going to be... Impatience could spring out. Or we know what, you know what I'm talking about here. And, but James goes on to say, no one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God. Um, since God is not tempted by evil, and he himself uh, doesn't tempt anyone. So when we're going through a trial or a test or whatever it might be, we can't blame God. You can't, we can't sort of go, oh God, you made me this way, or I couldn't help it, I had no choice. No. And James goes on to say, but each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by what? His own evil desire, that which Jesus says resides within us. And uh, James uses a language of hunting or being lured and being trapped. It's attractive, Right? And our evil desire inside of us can do that. And so James says, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. So in the trials of life, whatever they might be, Christians will find themselves battling with internal desires that can conceive sin. And then you see the progression, fully grown and then leads to death. And so they can be very attractive, uh, kind of like a baited hook. You go, oh, I really want that. But the end result's really not good at all. Uh, the last um, two weeks have been, as many of you will know, uh, been significant trial for me and my family after my dad died. And I had to negotiate things and organise things for the funeral, which took place uh, just the week gone by. And it's a great relief that that's happened and it's good to say goodbye. But many of my family members are not yet believers in the Lord Jesus, and it was tricky, to say the least. Um, I found it very difficult with one of my family members, what they said and what they did. And I was so tempted to give this person the rocket. (laughs) You know, I actually wrote a text, and I sent it to myself... (laughs) And I, said, I showed my wife Libby and I said, this is what I feel like. And I, I would be so sweet to see them go down. <laughs> it's terrible. And <laughs> Actually, I've done lots of funerals and I think my family's been the worst. Out of, no. <laughs> it's behind closed doors. Anyway. And, um, and Libby said to me, maybe that wouldn't be the most helpful thing to send. <laughs> and so I had to pray about it. And resist the desire, which I think it would have damaged relationships for 10, 20 years into the future if I'd said something. It felt sweet to want to do something. I had to resist it. 
So whatever desire we might have on the inside, and even if it might appear to be sweet, and we know it's contrary to God's word, it won't end up in a good place. We're encouraged to resist, to resist, resist temptation. Now, when you sin, what do you do? You repent. But when you get temptation, what do you do? You resist. So temptation is not yet sin. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says this, And no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted or tested beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted or tested, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Isn't that marvellous? So the believer in Jesus who has the Holy Spirit will want to resist and can actually, with God's help, resist. Now, it seems to me, in our world today, this whole idea of resisting temptation, it's just, that's an old idea, isn't it? Are we, do we ever talk about that today? Um, it's disappearing, certainly in regards to sexual desires. We're told we've got to embrace them all. It's actually key to our identity or something like that. Even some people say it's wrong to suppress or whatever. It's damaging. Um, but the follower of Jesus has received a game-changer in regards to their desires. It's a game-changer, something new. And so resisting is not suppressing. <laughs> resisting is actually freedom. It's actually the freedom <laughs> to live for the Lord. That's what it is, marvellous freedom. Now, sure, it's a struggle, but there's a fruit of joy and purpose. But the pers person who doesn't have God's spirit yet, they might try to suppress, but you know what happened? It'll just pop up somewhere else. It's like the bowling ball. You just can't change the tendency by yourself. It's impossible. You need a new power through the Lord Jesus Christ. And can I just say to you, that's the most important thing. It's not about trying to suppress this or that. It's coming to the Lord knowing, oh, my heart is all tangled up. And I know I've got all sorts of desires in there. And what I need is forgiveness. And what I need is cleansing. And what I need is help. And what I need to know is I'm accepted by God and can have new life. And when you do that, and when you turn to the Lord and say, oh, would you forgive me? Would you become Lord in my life? He will give you the gift of his spirit. And that is the game changer in this whole thing. You can't do it without God's spirit. Can I just say to you, if you're not yet a follower of the Lord Jesus, um, and this interests you, we'd love to talk to you about that because we believe God is good and he wants your flourishing. And so Paul says to Christians, if we live by the Spirit, we've been freed by the Spirit, we have great hope through the Spirit, well, let's walk in step with the Spirit. It's kind of like, you know, the lawn bowl is, the lawn bowl is launched and it's going to turn into the gutter and it's game over, but you know what? The Holy Spirit is there like a solid, smooth, comfortable wall and the ball comes, comes up against it and sure, there's a bit of friction or whatever, but through the Holy Spirit, God helps us to go on paths that are good for us. So what about same-sex sexual attraction then? Is it a sin? Well, any desire that can conceive sin and leads to death is to be resisted. It won't lead to our flourishing, God says. And so same-sex se sexual attraction always has the direction towards sin. Uh, can, can, see, can conceive sin that leads to death and so is to be resisted. Opposite sex sexual attraction doesn't always lead to sin because it can lead to God's purpose for sex which is the bond between a man and a woman in marriage. So there are godly ways to express opposite sex attraction. There are no godly ways to express same sex attraction. Well, let's remember here that's just one desire amongst many and it's maybe not necessarily the most important. We all have different desires, like anger that can lead to revenge or envy that can lead to saying destructive things or greed that can lead to robbing someone. As followers of the Lord Jesus, we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. Let's just, let's just admit it. <laughs> and let's seek to help each other. 
We have the waves of temptation and come bashing against the bow, trying to push the boat back on the rocks. But you know what? Now we have the sail of the Holy Spirit and God's Word is blowing in that and helping us to move forward for our flourishing. And so it's going to be a struggle, the Christian life, but it's the struggle of freedom. We've been freed. It's the struggle that leads to joy. It's the struggle that leads to fulfilment. It's the struggle that leads to contentment. It's the struggle that leads to to love and patience and healthy relationships. If we fall into sin, we're to repent and seek for for forgiveness. But if we are tempted, we are to resist. And the marvellous thing is that one day in the Lord's presence, um, the bowling ball is going to go straight every time. I don't know if that would make for a very interesting game. (laughs) It will. You know, the desire of the flesh, it'll be gone. And what will be left will be love, joy, peace, patience. What will be left is just human flourishing all over the place. And love for God and marvellous. We get a little taste of it now through the work of the Spirit. Um, But in the new creation, how marvellous will that be? Where all our desires are fixed up. Anyway, that's enough for today. If you want to do some more reading, grab those readings from that um, sheet of paper. Next week, we're going to think a little bit more practically about how we help each other, all of us, with our disordered desires so that we might flourish to God's glory. How about I pray? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you know us, you know us intimately, you know our hearts and all sorts of things that are going on there. That, Father, even ourselves, we find hard to untangle. We thank you that you love us deeply and that you care for us and that you are good and you want us to flourish. We pray for any amongst us who may not yet know you and have the marvellous gift of your spirit, that in your kindness you'd help them to come to see their need and that you might transform their lives. And for us, Lord, you've been so kind to us. Help us to be kind to each other. Um, Help us, Lord, to realise we all struggle with different things and temptation. Help us by your Spirit to resist so that those temptations don't conceive of something destructive. And help us to know, Lord, that all this is for our flourishing. And um, we pray, Father, that you'd help us to grow as a church family in this for your glory. Amen. Well, I hope that was helpful for you. Uh, Here at St Peter's, we consider ourselves to be God's dearly loved children. We're passionate for him, and we desire for everyone to know Jesus and to grow in him. And we have so many activities around that for toddlers, children, youth, uh, young adults, adults and more. Feel free to drop in any time at one of our gatherings at 8 a.m. It's kind of more traditional service, 10 a.m. or 4 p.m. We have children's programs or 6 p.m., In the evening, that's followed by dinner. You'd be more than welcome. If you'd like to know more about Jesus, we'd love to help you. We do a series called Hope, and you can meet new people. Or if you'd like to join St. Peter's, uh, we have a special series called Belong, which can help you find your feet. So let us know. You can text us on 0466 200 791. I'll repeat that for our radio listeners, 0466 200 791 or you can use the QR code which we'll leave up for the next minute or so. Enjoy your week.